Good morning. Welcome to Edgewood. Let's stand. Let's sing together. We taught you a new song last week. We're going to do it again. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. I was breathing but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide. It was my tomb till I met you. You called my name. You called my name. And I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. You called my name and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. His mercies are new every day. Now your mercy has saved my soul. Now your freedom is all that I know. Oh, the old made new. Jesus, when I met you, you called my name and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. You called my name and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. I needed rescue. I needed rescue. My sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future. My eyes are open. Cause when you called my name, I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. You called my name and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. Amen. Yes. Amen. Go ahead and be seated for a second, would you? Uh, welcome to Edgewood. Uh, my name is John, and I'm, uh, I'm so glad that you are here today. Uh, if, if it is your first time with us, uh, uh, we'd love to connect with you, and there's several ways to do that. We just want you to uh, pull out your cell phone. Let me wait for the slide to, to catch up there. We're having technical difficulty because I don't have the phone number memorized. It's under service host, guys. There we go. New to our church. Text welcome to 508-939-3227. We want to connect with you. Uh, you'll get a text with a link for some basic information, uh, but that is... Uh, that's a good way for us to connect um, if, if you want to do that. Also, today we are continuing the message series we've been in this summer on the Ten Commandments called Wisdom to Live By. It's how we can apply the Ten Commandments today, and we're uh, continuing with commandment number seven, and today is the significance of marriage. Uh, we also have an important event coming up uh, that we need some help with, so let's watch this video.
Hey Edgewood, I want to bring you up to speed on the Back to School Bash. We're partnering with churches and businesses from Mansfield and the surrounding communities to give out over 200 backpacks to elementary school children. Now from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. on Saturday, August 25th, the Back to School Bash will have games, crafts, food, and of course the backpack giveaway at the South Commons in Mansfield, and every bit of it is free. Now here are three things I want you to know about that weekend. Number one, school supplies. Last week, you did a great job bringing school supplies in to put in those backpacks. Now, if you take advantage of the sales that many of the stores are having, you can get a lot of supplies for less and make a big difference doing it. The supply list is on our Facebook page, so check it out and get the supplies back to us no later than Sunday, August 19th. Number two, helping on that Saturday. We've set aside four blocks of time to serve on that Saturday. There's a setup time that'll occur from 10 a.m. to noon, and then there are two periods of time to help with games or crafts, one from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m., and the second from noon to 2 p.m. And finally, there's a cleanup time that goes from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. A sign-up link will be available via email, and you can make a difference, a big difference, in just a little bit of time. Lastly, number three, on that Saturday, representatives from the Mansfield Food Pantry will be there and available to receive donations, canned goods or dry goods like rice or pasta, or you can drop off a monetary donation, whatever is easiest for you. So remember, number one, bring your donations of school supplies to the church no later than Sunday, August 19. Number two, sign up online to serve on that Saturday for just a two hour block of time. And number three, plan to bring a donation to the food pantry on that day, Saturday, August 25th. Again, it's the Back to School Bash, Saturday, August 25th, from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. It's going to be a great day to be together. Thanks again. I'll see you soon. Let's stand and sing together. When we gather each week to worship, we worship God because of who he is, because of what he's done for us. Let's celebrate today that our God is a big God, giver of life, giver of breath. Let's respond to who he is. You give life, you are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath. In our lungs, so we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. Let's sing that again. You give life. You are love. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise. It's your breath in 
in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. All the earth. All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These moans will sing. Great are you, Lord. All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. One more time, all the earth. All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, So we pour out our praise to you only. Great are you, Lord. Amen. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? Who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory. The King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would be set free. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. Set free. Oh, Jesus. 
Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. <clears throat> Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. Each week, one of the ways that we worship is, is by giving, and it's one way that we can come together and help people find and follow Jesus. Uh, we're in the middle of a 90-day giving challenge, uh, and we gave an update on, on you for that uh, last Sunday. If you missed that, uh, you can check it out on YouTube or our Facebook page and, and find it there. Uh, if, you are, if you are new today, in just a minute, uh, there's going to be volunteers passing offer in place. Don't feel any obligation or pressure to give today. Uh, but but if, if Edgewood is your church and, uh, and you feel led to, to contribute in this way, uh, we just encourage you to do so. You can do so now as the offering plates are passed as we continue to sing or, as, um, or online at any time. I think I've conditioned you to sit during this time. Let's all, let's, we're going to keep singing, guys. Come on, let's stand. And I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find thy power and thine alone. Can change the leper spots and melt the heart of stone. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. And when, and when before the throne I stand in him complete, Jesus died my soul to save, my lips shall still repeat, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. 
He washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow. And oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. His name is Jesus. Oh, praise the one. And oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up. From the dead. You may be seated. Each week, uh, we take communion together. And the communion is a celebration of what we just sang together. That our sin left us hopeless and helpless, and we had a debt that we couldn't repay, and a a sin left us separated from God. Then he sent his one and only son to this earth to die on a cross. And communion, I think, is is a lot of things. Sometimes we feel led to just reflect and it's somber, but communion can also be a a celebration, something that has joy wrapped up in it because we have been, he raised this life from the dead. Not only did he rise from the dead, but he raised this life from the dead, giving us hope, giving us purpose, and giving us eternal life one day with him. So in just a minute, uh, servers will come forward and and we'll take a, a piece of bread which symbolizes his body broken for us, and we'll take the cup which represents his blood that was shed for us. And we'll remember, we'll we'll take time to reflect and to celebrate all that Jesus has done for us. Let's pray together. God, we thank you. We thank you for your presence here today. We thank you for being present in our lives. God, even when it it doesn't seem like it, God, you're there. We thank you for making a way for us to know you, for paying our debt for making a way for us to to just know how much we are loved by you and to know you more deeply. We pray that today that as we we remember, as we celebrate what you've done, that it would bring you honor. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a couple of minutes ago, uh, we were singing, 
and uh, man, you guys sound good. Uh, I, just on a side note, I, I just have to thank you. You make it really easy for me to come up here when you sing like that. It's really encouraging. There's a line, and if I was going to paraphrase it, it would go something along these lines. Lord, I have found that you and you alone can change the leper's spots and melt a heart of stone. Now, <clears throat> now you and I, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> you and I, um, in the world in which we live and in the time in which we live, we don't get the whole leper thing. Um, maybe uh, a few decades ago, when uh, uh, the curse of AIDS was hitting our world, or maybe just a couple of years ago, the biological sentence of Ebola might get us to understand what that verse really, really means. But when you were diagnosed with leprosy, you weren't just done. You were a walking curse. You didn't see anybody again. You didn't talk to anybody again unless those individuals were others who also had been diagnosed with leprosy. And the author of the song dares to write that you, God, and you alone, you can even change the spots on the arm or the face of the leper. You can turn a curse into a blessing. Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote a powerful book. Some of you may have read it and, or at least are vaguely familiar with it called The Scarlet Letter. And it harkens back to a time uh, and a place not too far from here when uh, uh, one who was not even found guilty, but sometimes even rumored to have been guilty, would wear the letter signifying the sin that one was guilty of. And so the A for adultery was sewn on the front part of a woman's dress. She walked around with that mark around town. And you know, after a while, it didn't even matter if the A was there anymore. It's what that individual was known for. Now, I want you to understand, as we go through the Ten Commandments and have been going through them, <clears throat> those commandments that God gave were not to be used by you or me as social clubs to mark people, to beat people down with, to stain them irreparably. God gave us those things as a blessing to say, now that I have a relationship with you. I, I, do you understand that that's where they come from? They do not come from a perspective that says, if you want to have a relationship with me, here are ten rules that you need to live by. No, that's not what happened. God established the relationship with his people. And then he said, now that you and I are, are working together, are living together, are, are doing life together, here are some blessings that I want you to understand and live by. And that's where we find ourselves. We started off, let's have a, a little bit of review again. Uh, commandment one, you will have no other gods before me. This is the significance of who we worship. Okay? Commandment number two, uh, you shall not make an idol or worship it. This is the significance of how we worship. And in those two, we say, God, you're going to be first in our life. And, and secondly, I'm going to demonstrate the fact that you're first in my life by living a life that says you're first in my life. Okay? Commandment number three. You shall not misuse the name of God. This is the significance of words. Because if we use God's name flippantly, then what other words do we use flippantly? Does our honor or our word even mean 
anything. Okay? And this, uh, uh, fourth, remember the Sabbath. This is the significance of rest. God wants us, God knows we can work hard and we can do a whole bunch of things, but after a while, if we work too hard, we'll think that we're the ones that are responsible for our, our safety, our security, our wealth, and our health. And God wants us to take time out just to rest and remember that he's the one that provides everything. The significance of rest. Number five, honor your father and mother. The significance of honor. We understood that uh, mom and dad are to live lives worthy of honor. And having lived uh, or living uh, uh, lives worthy of honor, then we get to honor them. And we then be, will be honored by our children as we honor God. Okay, commandment number six, do not murder the significance of life. And that leads us to uh, where we are today. Commandment number seven, do not commit adultery. And this is the significance of marriage. The significance of marriage. Last week, we took a look at what Jesus said. And remember we, how he said, you've heard it said, don't, don't commit murder. But I tell you, if you even, um, that's not this one just yet. Um, but if you even uh, uh, are angry at your brother or your sister, then you're guilty of murder. And we said that Jesus didn't raise the bar. We lowered it. Remember? Because we, we will uh, rationalize or even excuse our anger. But the warning that Jesus was giving is that anger precedes those evil, harmful acts. It, it, it comes before it. it we just, it, that's the rationale for that. I, you know, I didn't mean to do that, but uh, I, I got angry and I said it. I didn't mean to do that, but I got angry and I did it. Well, the, Jesus picks up on the same thought in the, just a couple verses later. And he says, you have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery in his heart. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Now, um, guys, I, I don't know about your house, but this is what happens on, at my house. On, sometimes on Sunday afternoons, um, uh, especially as we get a little bit closer to Christmas time. Because as we get closer to Christmas time, there are a series of television commercials that come out sponsored by a woman's clothing store. Her name is Victoria. <laughs> All right? And so we'll just be sitting there, and, and here's what happens. I have absolutely no control over the television. I have no control over programming. I don't know what's coming. I don't know what's going. And I'm just sitting there, fat, dumb, and happy on the couch with a, with a nacho stain on my belly and, and, uh, and, and, and maybe uh, just enjoying a good cup of coffee. And all of a sudden, Victoria shows up on the screen. And Leslie says something along the lines of, where is the flipper? Give me that. And, um, you know, nachos get spilled and everything gets all over the place. And, and here's what's going on. Here's what's really going on. I'm not trying to watch it, but Leslie's actually protecting me. She is. She's protecting me because she's trying to help me to live by what Jesus just said. Because, guys, as long as you got a heartbeat... As long as you have half of a heartbeat, somehow, some way, in one way or another, it may not be that commercial, it may not be the billboard that you see here or there, but your brain's going to go where it shouldn't go. And it's not just guys either. And that's the point. In the same way, last week we said that anger precedes the murder, the thinking precedes the act, the thinking here precedes the act as well. Because you, you just got to guard yourself. My, uh, my brother-in-law uh, is, uh, is an airline pilot and uh, FedEx driver. And uh, I love his rule. Uh, he, he says, every guy gets the count of one Mississippi. Beyond one Mississippi, you got to turn your head. You got to. Because you don't want your brain to go where it's not supposed to go. It's, guy, it's just that simple. All right? And sometimes you have to go, <laughs> No, listen, I'm just telling you, that's what I do. No, 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 stop it. 
Because your brains go there. You can't help those kinds of things. It's a challenge, but that's what Jesus is saying. Protect yourself because it's the thinking that starts the process. That's the reality of it. Okay, now, here's what some will say, too. Well, good grief, Jesus. I mean, if, if thinking that way is going to get me in trouble and I'm just as guilty if I, as, as if I've done it, then I might as well just go all the way, right? No. <laughs> no, because thinking is not even close, damage-wise, as doing. It's just not even close. It may be difficult to not think a certain way, but you can stop yourself from going to a certain place or being with a certain person. You may not be able to avoid what you, where your brain goes when you see a, television on, a commercial on television, but you can avoid being with a person or going to a place. You can. You are not a mind-numb robot. You are a child of God. And he's redeemed you, and he cares for you, and he loves you, and he not only wants the best for you, but he wants the best for your family. And the challenges and the damages and the heartbreak and the heartache not just sticks with you, but carries on sometimes to the next generation and even the generation after that. I can't even begin to tell you how often I have sat at my desk and people will come in and they will break down and weep. I just, I don't know how it happened. Well, actually, yeah, you do. And I've said it that way. You just didn't want to stop. Maybe sometimes it starts with a simple little text. Or an invite on Facebook to become a friend. Or just a, a, a sitting across the table at lunch at work. Or whatever. But the fact of the matter is, we can stop. And it's worth it. Folks might also say, hey, listen, if, if it's hard, if it's that difficult for marriage, if, if the statistics are true, if the statistics are true that uh, marriage has a 50-50 chance, then, I mean, come on. No, actually, you know what? You can make the chances a whole lot better. You can. Guys, ladies, you can make them a whole lot better. And this morning, I want to share with you a couple of different things. Number one, that marriage directly mimics the relationship that you and I have with God. That's the first significance of marriage. It directly mimics the relationship that one has with God. Now, here, let me back all this up and kind of, because these com the commandments of God that we have are not separate. God doesn't just simply say, oh, how are you doing on number two? And how are you doing on number eight? And how's number three coming? And what about number five? Yeah, and we get independent uh, grades, so to speak, uh, on each of them. It, it's the whole thing. It's the whole thing. Because the scarlet letter wasn't uh, just one number out of ten. It stained everything. Everything. And the relationship that God has with us, he initiated. He said, this is special. He said, this is worthy. He said, I love you and I'm going to start this whole thing. And because I love you, I want you to live a certain way. Because when you live a certain way, not only will you please me, but you'll be blessed. You'll be encouraged. You'll be strengthened. You'll be happy. And that's why all of this matters. 
You see, because if we are, according to number one, putting God first in our lives, then listen, this is what I tell every young couple that comes to me for premarital counseling. It's not difficult, actually. It's really not difficult to make yourself second in the relationship if you've already made yourself second in your relationship with God. If God's in charge... And he, and he guides you and directs you and gives you wisdom and encouragement and counsel, then allowing someone else to give you wisdom and encouragement and counsel who also is, has made themselves second to God along those lives. By the way, that's exactly what Paul tells the, the, uh, the, the believers at the church in Ephesus. In Ephesians chapter 5, you probably heard this, but in the message version, I like the what it says here. His wives understand and support your husband in ways that show your support for Christ. You love the Lord, you love your husband. There's not a contradiction there, nor does it divide your loyalty. Then he says, husbands, go all out in love for your wives, exactly as Christ did for the church. A love marked by giving, not getting. You see, so when we devote ourselves to God, it's not difficult then to devote ourselves to someone else. Because as much as Leslie loves me, she wants me to love God more, and she loves God more than she loves me, and that's the way that I want it. It's not a division. It's not a, 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 as if there's divided loyalties. No, God set it up that way. Because you know what? Even after 30 years, we're not smart enough always to choose the right way. We're not smart enough always to do the right thing, but God is. And if we're going to lean on him first before we lean on our own collective wisdom, then chances are we're going to make the right choice. That's the point there. Marriage mimics uh, the relationship that uh, you and I have with God. And, And in that mimicking, then, we have the perspective that we really need to come to uh, uh, the second one that, uh, that's here there, marriage is significant because it directly impacts the passing on of faith. Marriage is significant. It directly impacts the passing on of one's faith. When we grow up, the people that are initially always right, no matter what, are mom and dad when we're really little. When you and I are in our earliest stages of thinking concretely from about age three or four all the way up to maybe nine or ten. When we begin to then transition out of eight, nine, and ten into associative thought where we begin to put different concepts together, that's when things sometimes begin to break down and we see mom and dad's weaknesses. But notwithstanding mom and dad's weaknesses, if we know that dad loves Jesus and we know that mom loves Jesus and because dad loves Jesus and mom loves Jesus, dad loves mom and mom loves dad, that's a pretty secure home. Notwithstanding their inevitable discovery, the children's inevitable discovery of the weaknesses of mom and dad. Notwithstanding that. It's not like we have to live perfect because we, you and I know that we can't and inevitably our kids discover that we can't. But if we're saying to our kids, I'm trying to do my best for God and that because I'm trying to do my best, I want you to grow up to do your best for God too. They get that. You know how I know? Because I've done it. They get it. It's significant to them. If you've got little ones, and, and listen, uh, grandparents, you can do this too when the little ones are, when uh, you're, the second generation is around there. Try this. You, you want to see how much fun this is? Try this. All right? So this is what you're going to do. Uh, uh, let's see. Okay. Here's what I want you to do. Stan, Jolie. In the kitchen this afternoon, okay? I hope your kids aren't listening because they are. Just kind of turn away for a little bit right there. All right? Here's what you, I want you to get in the kitchen. I just want you to, I just want you to start kissing. I don't want to, just... Just make it weird. Just weird. Just loud and I'm not. I'm All right. Now, they're a little older, but when they're younger, 
Oh no! Oh no! Dad's kissing mom! Dad's kissing! Stop it! Stop! They're running between your legs, and they're laughing, and they're giggling, and they're going all, Dad's kissing mom! Ah! Oh, that's oh, gross! And they absolutely love it. Because nothing is more, nothing is more secure when mom loves dad and dad loves mom. Nothing. Because remember, if mom loves Jesus and dad loves Jesus and then dad loves mom and mom loves dad, then kids associatively begin to understand that loving God is where it begins. However, If mom talks bad about dad and dad talks bad about mom and in today's technically advanced world where the nine-year-old is actually a whole lot better with your iPhone than you are and they read a text that they weren't supposed to read then everything that's supposed to be secure in their world is absolutely shattered. And just because you say it's the truth, it will be doubted. It will be doubted. It's just not worth it. It's just not worth it. Solomon writes in the book of Proverbs to his son. He says, My son, keep your father's command and do not forsake your mother's teaching. When you walk, they will guide you. When you sleep, they will watch over you. When you wake, they will speak to you. For this command is a lamp, this teaching is a light, and correction and instruction are the way to life, keeping you from the neighbor's wife and the smooth talk of the wayward woman. Remember, it's a father speaking to his son. Do not lust in your heart after her beauty or let her captivate you with her eyes. Can a man scoop fire into his lap without his clothes being burned? You need professional help to not understand that question. Can a man walk on hot coals without his feet being scorched? So is he who sleeps with another man's wife. No one who touches her will go unpunished. People do not listen to this. He distinguishes this even from what we're going to deal with in a couple of weeks. Do not steal. People do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy hunger when he's starving. Yet if he is caught, he must pay sevenfold. Though it costs him all the wealth of his health. But a man who commits adultery has no sense. Whoever does so destroys himself. You, 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 uh, do I want to destroy myself today? Hmm. No. Of course you don't. Of course you don't. I don't care how difficult things may be. I don't care how nice or he may be or pretty she may be or comforting she may be or encouraging he may be it's not worth it it's just not the scars that are left oh i don't even be, i don't have the time or the words to begin to tell you the hell that i have seen and heard in families that aren't mine and families that are mine. It's just not worth it. Just in case, did you know that children of divorce, and by the way, infidelity is the number one cause for divorce. Children of divorce are twice as likely to drop out of school. Three times as likely to get pregnant as teenagers. Six times as likely to be in poverty. Twelve times more likely to be incarcerated than children whose parents remain married. 
I'm not making that stuff up. You can go online and find a whole bunch more statistics that are there. And when I read those things, I want you to understand that those kinds of decisions impact not only oneself, but the next generation as well. Because the insecurity is passed on. The worry, the doubt, the awkwardness, it's all passed on. But see, if one leans on the Lord and, and a woman recognizes and sees that in her husband and a man recognizes and sees that in his wife, not that everyone's perfect or has the capacity to be so, but there's a leaning on that and there's an understanding, there's a forgiving, then, then <clears throat> the, the boys and the girls recognize that dad loves mom and mom loves dad and dad loves God and mom loves God. And I understand that when dad says it, he means it. <clears throat> and when mom says it, she means it. And are they perfect? Absolutely not. But they're doing their dead level best because they know I also am not perfect <clears throat> and I'm doing my dead level best. And that, that literally, with, before you even begin to explain what the word grace means, the kids don't necessarily need the explanation because they've watched it all their life. They've seen what forgiveness looks like. They've seen what strength looks like. They've seen what it means to be happy. Even though things aren't always perfect. They've seen what it means to be loved even though sometimes I'm not lovable. This is where we go. Because the, the way that God wants us to live is worth it. And the things that always look shiny and pretty, well... Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote his book, Scarlet Letter. But in the book of John, Jesus is violently introduced to a woman that the Bible says was caught in the act of adultery. You can just see what a nightmare this would be thrown in front of a whole bunch of people her most embarrassing moment not just simply witnessed but now uh, put on display for any and all who don't have any business judging but will certainly stop in the middle of the day to do so and the crowd is yelling <clears throat> and everybody is screaming what a piece of trash just forget her right now. Let her be. Let her be the trash that we know that she is. And Jesus is just standing there listening to all this and a whole lot more. There are kids in the room, so I won't use some words. And after they're done screaming and spitting and having picked up stones, getting ready to throw them, Jesus just kind of kneels down a little bit. He takes his finger and he draws something in the ground. We don't know what it was, and for the most part, it doesn't matter. And then he stands up and he quietly says, Hey, um, I understand, I think, a little bit of what's going on here. And I just, before you guys summarily begin the execution process. I just would kind of like to maybe put some things in order. Uh, any of you who would like to, uh, if you have never sinned before in your life, you throw first. And the Bible says that they all began to walk away the oldest people first. And what Jesus did next 
is what Jesus has done for so many of us. And if he hasn't done it for you, I'm going to tell you how he can in just a minute. He reaches down, speaks to this brokenhearted, humiliated, just almost irreparably wounded woman. And in the most gentle voice you and I can possibly imagine says, where'd they all go? There's no one here to condemn you. And I'm not going to either. So you go on home. And listen, sweetie. Don't do this anymore. And the letter was removed. You want your letter removed? I don't care whether it's an A or an L or, or an S or an A for anger or a J for jealousy, or an F for frustration, or whatever it happens to be, you want that removed, come to Jesus. Nobody here is going to throw any stones because <clears throat> we don't have any to throw. We've got nothing to throw at anybody. If anything, we could, we could only just wound our own selves for the stupidity that we've committed in our own lives. But praise God that that stupidity is no longer remembered. We don't have any letters sewn on our chest. The only thing we've got is the J that stands for Jesus because he's the one that now writes on our heart, impacts our minds, and guides us with everything that we do. And we live for him. And we found that living for him is a whole lot better than you and I trying to figure out how to live for ourselves. If you don't know Jesus, if Jesus hasn't, you haven't heard his voice say, I'm no longer condemning you, let me help you to understand that you can take care of that right here and right now. You can acknowledge not only that you've done stupid stuff like I have or anybody else here, but you can acknowledge that God uh, loves you and sent Jesus for you and wants you to be forgiven, wants you to accept the fact that Jesus died for you on the cross, just like John said a little bit ago when we remembered with that small piece of bread and that small cup of juice. And having been forgiven of your sins, then you can uh, be that new person and get baptized in the water, have, like the Bible says, just to wash all that junk away. And when, you, when that happens, what, what goes on is, is that very same kind of scene. Who's left to condemn you? I'm not going to either. Now go, don't live like that anymore, but live for God. That's how we do that. That's what it means to find and follow Jesus. Let's pray. God, thanks so much for giving us an example of what it means to live for you. God, there are marriages and families that have done this really, really well. And then there are marriages and families that have had just the hardest time. Sometimes it's a little bit, and sometimes it's just an absolute mess. But God, the, the depth of the mess seems significant to us, but it's nothing to you. You heal and you break curses. You break chains. You bring people back together. You restore homes. You restore families. You take the curse of generations away and you restore it into a blessing that can be passed on from one father to his son, from one mother to her daughter, and so on. God, we love the way that you love us. We thank you so much. And as we grow in our relationship with you, I pray that you'll help husband and wife to grow together, parent and child to grow together, so that the relationship that we have with you can be seen between mom and dad. And having witnessed it, then the child will say, that's what I want to do when I grow up. That's how I want to do this. I want to find someone who loves you, God. I want to uh, be with someone who knows you, who will keep me honest so that I can keep them honest. And that, Lord, is how you always intended it to be. So God, we pray for families who are struggling. We pray that they will see you first, that they will seek you first and then be restored having found you. And for those of us who are still trying to do our best as we raise our kids and 
and, and, and help them to uh, seek you. Lord, let that seeking start with us and stay with us. Help us to rise with you and lay our heads down at night with you. Help us to cry, your, cry out your name when we're worried and praise your name when we're blessed so that our kids will see and know that you always keep your promises. We love you, God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. pleasure worshiping with you today. Hope you have a great week. God bless.